right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jana Bodor, and I'm the Assistant Director of Lawyers Chapters here with the Federalist Society. Um, Seth Zirkel, um, the chapter president, was going to introduce our speaker today, but he's having some technical issues. So I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, we're delighted to have Tim Carney from AEI joining us. Um, Tim Carney is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he works on economic competition, cronyism, civil society, localism, and religion in America. He is concurrently the commentary editor at the Washington Examiner. Um, Mr. Carney's latest book, Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse, was published in February 2019. He has previous books that include Obamanomics, How Barack Obama is Bankrupting You and Enriching His Wall Street Friends, Corporate Lobbyists and Union Bosses, and The Big Ripoff, How Big Business and Big Government Steal Your Money, which was awarded the 2008 Culture of Enterprise Award by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. In addition to his Washington Examiner columns, Mr. Carney's work has been published in a variety of magazines, websites, and newspapers, including The Atlantic, New York Post, The New York Times, Reason Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. His TV appearances include CNBC, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and the PBS NewsHour. Um, with that, I will turn it over to you, Tim. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you, Jana. Uh, thanks to Seth. I'm sorry that his uh, web connection was uh, too bad. I hope he he gets on here. Um, and uh, Jana mentioned my uh, recent book, the the Alienated America, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. And it's a I'm a guy from New York. I'm born in Greenwich Village. I live in Washington D.C. And it's a to some extent a book I wrote because I learned a lot about our country in, in the last few years. And so the story I have to tell is a, a story of the uh, American dream. It's a, also, to some extent, a story of how Donald Trump became our president. I'm going to talk about politics. This isn't a talk about politics, so it's a, a talk about culture. So I do have uh, slides here. I'm not a pro at this, but I think um, I can get them up there. All right. So what we have here, um, uh, can I make this be the full screen? Uh, there we go. That's my book. The story about the uh, whether the American dream is dead. It's a story about work, it's a story about family. It's a story about faith. And it's a story about why people think the American dream is dead. Now, I'm a political reporter, as was mentioned at the Washington Examiner, so my story actually begins in Iowa, and I'm an Irish Catholic, and so my story begins in a bar. It was Joe's Place in Iowa City, in the run-up to the 2016 uh, Republican caucuses, and I met a couple there that worked at the university. The woman said she was originally from Orange City, Iowa. I didn't hadn't heard of Orange City, Iowa. I didn't know what it was. Um, and as an Irish Catholic, if you guys know your history, you might know that the color orange can be a little triggering. So I asked her what the orange in Orange City stood for. So this woman, whose name was Holly Vander something, explained to me that in that they're very Dutch. And I said, how Dutch? Like in New York, Irish were really Irish. Italian were really Italian. In Washington, D.C., people didn't necessarily have so much ethnicity. This woman said, I used to march in my wooden clogs past Windmill Square for the annual Tulip Festival. So the more she went on that about Orange City, the more it sounded like a, a Simpsons episode send up of like a small Midwestern town where everybody was Dutch. And interestingly enough, um, as I was finishing the book, the New Yorker magazine did a, uh, a profile on the town and sort of channeling the argument that people in this town make for why to stick around. And again, this is rural Iowa said, there are plenty of jobs. It'll take you five minutes to drive to work. When you have children, we'll help you take care of them. People here share your values. It's a good Christian place, and they care about you. If anything happens, they'll have your back. That's another picture of Orange City, Iowa, from like the 2016 uh, Tulip Festival. So I had to go. I traveled out to Orange City and to Sioux County more broadly. I went to a Jeb Bush event in Sioux County. You see, it's up there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and 
one thing I found is, yes, they really are Dutch out there. First woman I met was named Wilhelmina, named after the Queen of the Netherlands in the two world wars. Um, the other interesting thing, remember, travel back in time, Republican caucuses, 2016. This was a Jeb Bush rally. There I met people who were Cruz supporters. They were Rubio supporters, Kasich supporters. I didn't meet a single Trump supporter. And there was a pastor who told me that out of the 900 people in his uh, congregation, he knew only one who was going to vote for Trump in this very conservative town, only one who was going to vote for Trump in the caucuses. And sure enough, when Iowa voted, Sioux County was Trump's single worst county in the caucuses. He got 11 percent there. His other two worst counties you see on that map, Lyon and Marion County. Marion has Pella, Iowa, famously a Dutch place, and Lyon, and the, those are the second and third most Dutch counties in Iowa. By the, the census is open-ended question, what is your ancestry? More people say Dutch in Sioux County than any other. And the other counties were Trump bombed and Cruz won for the most part were these things. So what was going on in these Dutch counties? Um, to help find out, I went out to Michigan. Those red counties on that map are counties that Trump won in the Republican primary in Michigan. Uh, the bluish ones are Kasich. And the orange ones, including Grand Rapids and Holland, Michigan, were Ted Cruz counties. I even looked up the single most Dutch municipality in America, and it was Door Township in Michigan. And that was Cruz's single best precinct in all of Michigan. Again, something was going on. I asked Cruz, I said, why do you keep winning the Dutch places? And he said, well, Tim, you met the Dutch. They're nice people. Donald's not a nice person. They want to vote for a nice person. And I was thinking, like Ted Cruz? It didn't, didn't quite sound convincing. Somebody else gave me the explanation that the Dutch were upset at Trump for appropriating the color orange. This didn't sound correct to me either. So I went out to Oostburg, Wisconsin. Oostburg, another Dutch community. And um, well, I had asked back in uh, Orange City or in Sioux County, at least, I had said, why what, what makes these places distinctive, these Dutch places? And he said, and this husband of a professor told me, well, out here, people vote right, but they live left. I didn't know what he meant by that. And what he meant was, he said, well, here, uh, people look after their neighbors. They take care of other people. They take care of the community. They take care of the environment, but they don't turn to the government for support. I'm a conservative guy. I thought that was slightly obnoxious description for, for live left, but I knew what he meant. There was tight knit community and a strong sense of debt to community. And where it all came from and the ties to the Dutch became clear when I was in Oostburg because I got there on a Sunday morning, sitting at the counter of Judy's diner and in came all the families from the uh, 9, 15 a.m. or whatever at the the, the church service at the Christian Reformed Church. And then now comes the 9 a.m., uh, the 9.30 at the uh, First Reformed Church and the Bethel Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And then there was a 9.30 and some Fourth Christian Reformed Church, all from this Dutch Reformed tradition, four of these churches in a village of 2000, the village of Oostburg. So the thing that made these Dutch communities tight-knit and strong were the churches, the Christian schools, and the other institutions that had spun out of them. What had happened is a, 150 years ago, a bunch of uh, Dutch religious refugees had settled in Western Michigan, in parts of Iowa, and a couple other parts of the country, including Oostburg. And they had planted not just churches, but they had planted communities and other institutions that created a, uh, a good scaffolding for people to build a good life. And importantly, in the year 2016, created, made it easier for people to avoid the other maladies of rural America. And that's what was the story. The guy who came down the escalator and said, the American dream is dead and we have to make America great again. His argument resonated in so much of the of America because the American dream seemed dead. But in the places like Oostburg and Holland and Orange City where the American dream seemed alive, the voters just weren't interested in him when they had other conservative choices. And again, it's not just uh, the Dutch closer to home, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. That's where I lived at the time. I've just jumped across the river to Virginia. Um, 
But uh, you see coming up from the bottom of the screen is Arcola Avenue. And uh, from the top is Kemp Mill. And each one of those roads has a large modern Orthodox synagogue. What does that mean? That whole neighborhood that you're looking at there on that map is uh, almost everybody who lives there are Orthodox Jews who observe pretty strict Sabbath rules, including do not drive on the Sabbath. So they all have to walk there. What does that do? That builds an incredibly tight-knit community. Silver Spring is in Montgomery County, which is very wealthy, but Silver Spring is sort of the middle-class part of Montgomery County. The whole middle-class part of Montgomery County voted for Ted for Donald Trump in the Republican primary. These precincts voted for Ted Cruz. Again, tight-knit religious community, no interest in Trump, voting for Ted Cruz in the primary. So... Um, now another part of Montgomery County, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, sometimes people think that's a house. There are probably houses that look like that in Chevy Chase, Maryland, but that's a country club. Chevy Chase, you might remember from the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. It's where he grew up. Um, it's the wealthiest municipality in the D.C. area, which is arguably the wealthiest area in the country, which is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. It's very different from Oostburg in that, yes, it's a village of about the same size, um, but instead of houses costing 150,000 houses there in 2016, cost 1.5 million. It's probably 2.5 million now. But like Oostburg, Donald Trump absolutely bombed here. It wasn't Ted Cruz who won the Republican primary. It was John Kasich. And so what else do we know about a place like uh, Chevy Chase? Uh, again, uh, Trump got 16 percent here. Uh Michigan, we talked about Western Michigan, Trump losing the wealthiest parts of Michigan, suburb of Gross Point. Trump bombs there, Kasich wins. What did we see? Trump absolutely failed among the elites in Chevy Chase and Gross Point, similar to how he failed in these religious conservative places. So if you look at these in the Republican primaries and caucuses, what were Trump's worst counties where he got less than 20%? Every one of these counties fits into one of three categories. Most of them are Mormon counties, Idaho, Utah, et cetera. Three of them you see are Dutch counties in Michigan, Marion, uh, Michigan, and Iowa. And then the rest of them are elite counties, meaning people with college educations, the percentage of the population over 25 with college education. So everyone in there is one of the, is a very Mormon county, a very educated county, or a very Dutch county. So this kind of seems like two different things put together, right? It kind of seems like, oh, well, the elites rejected Trump, and, the, and before he became the nominee, the religious conservatives rejected Trump. But what I argue is that these are one type of place. What you're looking at here are places that have strong institutions of civil society, places where people belong to something, whether it's that country club in Chevy Chase or one of those four churches in Oostburg. These are places that have built up strong institutions of civil society that people belong to. And when people say the American dream is alive, it doesn't have so much, it has something to do with economics, but that's secondary. What it largely is, is a cultural thing. Are there things for you to belong to? Do you have connection? Do you have, do you know your neighbors? What you're looking at in these counties that had nothing to do with Trump in the early primaries is the places where the American dream seemed alive and well because the little platoons were alive and well. That's my argument in Alienated America, that the suffering of so much of middle America is not a simple economic story. It's a cultural one. It's about the collapse of civil society and the little platoons. What does civil society do for us? Well, one thing is it helps us get married. It's a picture of uh, Lena Dunham. Now, if you remember, she was like a, a feminist screen, screenwriter 10 years ago. And a lot of people think, and you know, she's from New York, highly educated, liberal. A lot of people when uh, conservatives when they think about kind of the liberal elite, college educated, wealthy, yada, yada, they assume that they're all sort of radical feminists or they're swingers or they reject traditional morality. 
But if you go into Chevy Chase, if you go into Park Slope, Brooklyn, if you go into these places, what you're going to find is liberal elites living the life that Christian conservatives preach. That is, people finish school, get married, or finish school, get a job, get married, have kids, stay involved in their kids' life and their community's life. What scholars here at AEI and the Brookings Institution call the success sequence. So it's what I call the Lena Dunham fallacy, which is the belief that the liberal elites aren't living sort of this conservative uh, success sequence. So who, why is the marriage rate falling in America? It's falling among everybody, but it's mostly falling among the working class. Those three lines there represent women who have a college education, that's red, women who have some college, or college degree is red, some college is green, never went to college but finished high school is blue. 1960, there was no difference in the marriage rates among them. By 2016, there was a massive drop in all of them, but shortly after 2016, it fell below 50%. Most working class women are unmarried at age 40. The reason I pick age 40 there is because uh, to work out some of the delay in marriage, but also to work out some of the divorce. The delay in marriage is stronger among college educated women. Divorce is, uh, is higher among working class. Stable families are much more are much less common in the working class. That, I argue, is because the working class is where this collapse of community is concentrated. What does community do for us? It gives us models of other married people. It gives us the ability to meet the person we're going to marry. It gives us babysitters. It gives us support. It gives us a community in which the idea of raising kids can seem kind of appealing. And there's a little league. There's a park where the institutions fall apart. The idea of marriage is, uh, is harder to pull off harder to hold together, and doesn't seem as attractive. Similarly, the collapse in the birth rates, I think, is due to the collapse in civil society. As a wise woman once put it, it takes a village to raise a child. And the less that we have villages, the less people are going to think that they can manage children. Another thing that uh, community does for us, and it's easy to take for granted if you grew up with it, but um, is a human level safety net. That was my daughter, Eve. Uh, she was just about one years old and one day she got sick and then the next day she got sicker. And then when my daughter was, when my wife went off to the later mass, I had gone to the earlier mass with most of the kids. My wife stayed home with Eve. My wife goes off to the late Sunday morning mass with the oldest child. Um, just so everybody knows there's a happy ending to this story, but, um, we, uh, Eve sort of got very, um, very lethargic. She had trouble breathing. I tried calling Katie, my wife on the phone. She's not answering. Of course, her phone's off because it's during church. And so, and I don't have the car. So I have to throw Eve into a jogging stroll or sprint down to a or urgent care center. Uh, urgent care center doesn't have strong enough oxygen to get through to her lungs. She had RSV, which a lot of you might've heard about in the last few years. Um, it's a respiratory virus, and it's basically a, a cold that gets all the way into their, the smallest parts of their lungs. So then take her to Holy Cross Hospital where my children were born. They don't have strong enough oxygen. We have to go to Children's Hospital. Thankfully, Children's Hospital sets her on a path to be able to breathe and says, we just have to wait for this virus to clear. She's getting enough oxygen, but only through the machine. So then we have to stay in the hospital for four days. Not great. Um got five other kids at home. What, what happens? We get so much food brought to our house that our fridge was overflowing. My kids said, we had the best school lunches that week. And of course, every other day I had been making them school lunch. So not exactly a compliment. Um, uh, the nurses were saw that people were smuggling like beer and chocolate in for me at the hospital. And they said, who are all these people bringing you this stuff, barbecue and drinks and food? And I, I, I was describing them. And as I was describing these people, I said, oh, well, that was a guy from the examiner. That was a, a guy that was sent by a guy from AEI. That couple uh, is from our neighborhood pool. That's somebody from St. Andrews. That's somebody who I coached in Little League. That's his dad. And I realized as I was describing these friends and this big network of friends my wife had my wife and i had it wasn't just 
bilateral connections of us to friends. I kept naming the institutions through which we knew these people, the school, the work, the pool, the church. Our safety net in those days, the people who picked up the carpool and drove our kids to school, who watched our kids and put them to bed while my wife drove down to the hospital and while I drove home, it was all because of the institutions we had invested our time in. People like to use a term, sociologists use the term social capital, like it's an economic term. We had built up social capital that we didn't know we had, like an insurance plan by coaching Little League, coaching T-ball, just going to church, just sending our kids to these schools. And we tapped into it like an insurance product in this week that Eve was in the hospital. That's one of the major things that uh, civil society does. It also causes upward mobility. Uh, Raj Chetty, an economist, has looked at what are the things he does his economist stuff, uh, multivariate regression analysis. What are the things that cause upward mobility that caused children born to poor families to do better. Things that help, but not so much, I put on the right there, student-teacher ratio. It's good, but not so much. One thing you might think is, was this economy dependent on manufacturing? Maybe that predicts uh, that the former industrial towns will not have high upward mobility. He found that that doesn't really explain much if you account for the other three things on the left there. Teenage labor force participation is a big one. But social capital, basically Robert Putnam's measures in bowling alone. Do people belong to libraries, bowling leagues? Do they volunteer? Do they go to church? That was one of the major predictions in local upward mobility. Number one was how many children are raised, what portion of children are raised by a pair of married parents. It's another thing that strong community does. It's not just a nice thing to be able to wave to your neighbors. It's essential as a human level safety net. It allows us to form families and it causes upward mobility. So what happens in the places where social capital is missing, where community is missing? Right before the 2016 election, the general election, I went down to Fayette County, Pennsylvania. I picked it because I had found a study showing a major drop off in church attendance and religious adherence for both evangelical Christians and Catholics down in Fayette County. And while I was sitting at the bar at Smitty's in Uniontown, the county seat, I found um, that they had higher drug use than any county besides Philadelphia, lower, lower marriage rates than almost any other county, higher rates of mental illness and higher unemployment down there in Fayette County. So I said, I picked a place where the American dream really might seem dead. And I was, uh, I was talking a lot to um, uh, talking a lot to the people there at the bar, and they started. I said, "What's what's wrong with the economy here?" And I got conflicting stories. Some people said, "Oh, it's uh, there's no jobs here," but then other people said, "Oh, nobody wants to work." So I said, "Okay, which one is it? You can't have a labor shortage and a labor excess, right?" Um, and the bar owner said, well, actually, what the problem is that these welfare programs make it so that people don't have an incentive to work. And then you start getting the stories. If you go to enough places like this, you hear all the same stories. They're all third hand stories of welfare queens. Oh, I saw this guy at the checkout counter uh, or my neighbor saw this guy at the checkout counter buying, trying to buy dog food with the food stamps. When they said he couldn't do that, he grabbed a T-bone steak and said, Fido's going to eat well tonight. And while Uniontown is racially diverse, the clientele of Smitty's was not. It was a 100% white bar. And there was a, a racial undertone to some of the stories they were telling. And also, I noticed these people telling these stories about lazy, non-working people were telling me these stories at a bar on 2.30 on a Tuesday. Now, yes, I was at the bar on 2.30 on a Tuesday, but it was literally my job to be there. But these guys, I asked them, I said, Dave, uh, you're talking about lazy guys, but you're sitting here at the bar on a Tuesday afternoon. He says, well, I can't work because of my back. Tells these excruciating stories of back surgeries. And so then I ask him, so there's no uh, like office jobs or desk jobs you can do here that aren't as trying? He said, no, I can't do a desk job because I can't sit at a desk for half an hour. I said, Dave, you've been sitting at a bar stool for 90 minutes with me. And he said, well, today I'm numb because my son died this morning. Dave hadn't been to the bar in 10 years. He hadn't had a drink in 10 years, but his son had died of an opioid overdose that morning. And 
here it was, the statistics I knew. I'd looked them up an hour earlier, and I still didn't realize it. I still hadn't put a face on it until Dave's face was looking me in the eye. And all the accounts at that time in October of 2016 that the American dream is dead or we need to make America great again, that those words just meant, oh, these, you know, white uh, heterosexual Christian men are just angry that they lost their privilege. All those accounts were so clearly false to me at that point. I knew that in the places where the American dream seemed dead, there were real human costs to this collapse of civil society. And so, again, the, the collapse in marriage is really rooted in the collapse in community. The collapse in church uh, really leads to bad outcomes. Robert Putnam, I mentioned him. He wrote Bowling Alone. He wrote a follow-up book called American Grace. What, or actually, this quote is from Our Kids, another follow-up book he wrote. Quote, church-going kids have better relations with their parents and other adults, have more friendships with high-performing peers, are more involved in sports and other extracurricular activities, are less prone to substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, smoking, risky behavior, and delinquency. Going to church is good for your health. The collapse in the economy lead, when the steel mills in Fayette County closed down, it led to the coffee shops that serve them closing down. It led to the collapse in the economy. The bartenders at Smitty's have been back three or four times. They said one of them has two kids and she just says there's nothing to do on a Friday night. If I wanted to have a nice family night, the uh, go-kart place shut down 10 years ago. The roller rink shut down. You've got Smitty's, but you don't really have uh, a place for a family outing. Um, and so what are the causes of this? There's a few. The way I put it, the root causes, I got it from Alexis to Tocqueville. And I'll hurry up on this and we can talk about solutions in the uh, in the discussion. But crowding out by over-centralized government. But also, what sounds like the opposite, a sort of culture of hyper-individualism. These two things sound opposite, over-centralization, hyper-individualism. But they're really two different sides of the same coin, as, as Tocqueville explains. A society with fewer things that you belong to, it's a society where there's fewer horizontal connections between individuals and more connections between the central state and individuals. So there was crowding out, the Great Society and the New Deal, a lot of studies have pointed out how those ended up uh, under uh, eroding local institutions. Churches that used to do welfare program to feed the poor stopped doing it because the government did it. And then one of the reasons people volunteer and go and belong to a library or belong to a church is as an opportunity to serve others. You could just make sandwiches in your kitchen and hand them to homeless people, but it's much easier. It's much more accessible to serve others by belonging to an institution that then directs you out to do it. The mass media involves a centralization of our attention. More people know about George Santos than they know about their own congressman right now. And then also hyper-individualism. A lot of that has to do with technology, with the fact that it's much easier to unplug from everybody around us and plug in to that. And then the sexual revolution has made it so that the decision to have a child is just a personal choice. It's like having a motorcycle. If my neighbor's motorcycle wasn't working, I might help him out if I have free time, but I don't feel it's my duty. If my neighbor's kid is missing, it is my duty to help him find them. My neighbor's kid is injured and I see it, it is my duty. But our society has made having children into a personal choice and thus raising kids is harder and thus we don't feel that we owe a debt kids are actually a having kids doesn't just make you need community more it actually builds community um another here i'll try to share the screen again um so another thing driving um so this i think is a perfect example of Hyper-individualism and over-centralization. You might remember this from the 2012 campaign, The Life of Julia. It was a slideshow the Obama campaign put out to describe how Obama's first term helped people and how Romney would destroy everybody. So you see little baby Julia. Uh, she's enrolled in Head Start. That's great. Romney would take that away from her. That would be horrible. Um, 
It's a good thing she has head start because she doesn't appear to have a family. Then here you see uh, she takes the SATs race to the top program thanks to President Obama. She probably graduated number one in her high school class because she's the only human being here. I don't know why they need two water fountains. She's the only one there. Oh, she graduates college. Federal student loans are more manageable because income-based federal student loan payment, again, likely the valedictorian. She goes through life totally alone, but that's fine because she's got the government. Um, so then you've got uh, Julia decides to have a child. A little odd. The first human being to appear besides her is that little bump in her stomach. Um, it's kind of like, I'm a Catholic, so it's like the, the virgin birth, but instead of the Holy Spirit being involved, it's the Department of Health and Human Services, I guess. She's able to live this life of no other humans in her life because of the government. That is a message sent forth here. Over-centralization, hyper-individualism, two sides of the same coin, which gets at one of the most important root problems I'll address, and then we'll go to questions. But the collapse of church attendance. And I say attendance importantly here. America is becoming more secular, but the things, the aspect of religiosity that correlates with good outcomes the most is not sort of is, uh, intensity of belief, frequency of prayer, any of that. It's attendance. Drop off in church attendance hurts civil society because as Robert Putnam laid out, half of all civic civil society originates in the church. So one of the root causes is an effort to chase religion out of the public square. Liberal writer Kevin Drum in 2012, I'm tired of religious groups operating secular enterprises like hospitals and schools, hiring people of multiple faiths, serving the general public, taking taxpayer dollars, and then claiming that deeply held religious beliefs should exempt them from public policy. This had to do with the contraceptive mandate. So it didn't have anything to do with taking taxpayer dollars. It was whether an employer was allowed to refuse, whether nuns should be forced to cover birth control. And if the nuns were the kind of nuns who just sat there cloistered and prayed, Kevin Drum would be fine with them. But once they started doing what he called were secular undertakings, such as taking care of the sick and educating the young, that's when they had to start following all the rules. Barack Obama had a tell. He would occasionally talk of the freedom of worship instead of what the Constitution practices, the free exercise of religion. This is important because in my religion, Christianity, you can't exercise your religion just on Sundays. The main way we exercise our religion is by loving our neighbor, by serving them, by, as Pope Francis would say, including the poor. Now, that is... Um, that is not possible if we're supposed to keep our religious beliefs away, tucked away in private. There's a ton of other root causes of the collapse of civil society, but I, I want to race into questions now because we've only got about a little more than 20 minutes. Um, so let me just finish up with this note. There's no one central solution to the collapse of civil society. The Surgeon General's recent uh, report on the uh, rise of loneliness has made it uh, clear that there's a hundred different causes, but thankfully the Surgeon General didn't try to propose a US Department of Local Community Cohesion because that would undermine it. What's needed is a hundred thousand little local solutions. What those are is gonna vary on the different needs. Rural America, you know, rural Indiana is going to have different needs uh, than Appalachia and then urban Detroit. And, I'm unfortunately not a great solutions guy, but I think we should talk about them if you guys are curious. But also just, it's easy to forget that the root cause is not simply economics, it's not simply policy, it's gotta do with the collapse of civil society because where we all find the American dream is in the things that we belong to. So thank you very much. And I guess if you have questions, um, just unmute yourself and shout it out or raise hands. I don't know if Jean is gonna give any, any guidance there. Yeah, um, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself if you have a question. I think I've given permission for everyone to be able to talk, so.
Tim, this is uh, Seth Circle. I hope my my audio is coming through. I'm uh, I don't know what's going on with my connection today, but uh, one question I wanted to ask um, is: you had mentioned participation at churches. I'm assuming that that's. Uh, I don't know if you've looked at other faith traditions uh, with with uh, within Judaism, especially um, having lived up in the D.C. area ourselves for a while, uh, familiar with um, with that, and also in, the, the in and around Baltimore. Um, didn't know if you've seen a, a similar um, drop off in participation in synagogue worship or social aid uh, programs, social support programs that synagogues offer the Jewish communities. Didn't know if you've looked at that. And the second part would be participation in um, what I'd call civic organizations. Um, actually, just uh, you know, a number of us uh, are members of, for instance, the American Legion, uh, you know, Veterans of Foreign Wars. I realize a lot of that was a function of America's involvement um, in ongoing wars throughout the 20th century. But I don't know if you've looked at participation in any of those organizations and what impact that has on social cohesion that you've spoken about today. Yeah, so those are, are, are two really interesting questions. Um, one of the things that's interesting as we're looking for this uh, data is what you always have to look for what can show up on a map or in a poll. And um, Jews in America don't really show up in polls because there's so few of them. They can show up on a precinct map. That's why I picked the modern Orthodox communities. One thing that I've generally seen is that um, the anybody that's not orthodox just has seen a massive drop off in attendance among uh among jewish populations and so that's something that is analogous to uh christian stuff which is that you know the more orthodox the more they demand of you the more likely you are to show up um that uh just show up on sunday because it's kind of nice show up on saturday because it's kind of nice that that doesn't work so that could be a whole different study about religion and i've had that discussion in sort of my alienated book tour when i talked to pastors and jewish groups the veterans world is very interesting it's one of the places of really dynamic civil society because it the need for it is so clear Sebastian Younger's uh, book, Tribe, came out a little before Alienated America, and in it, he made in a very compelling way a similar argument that one of the great, amazing draws of the military is that you actually do have this intimate connection with a handful of other people. You're engaged in the same difficult undertaking aimed at a higher purpose outside of yourself. And one of the reasons we have PTSD and mental health issues and drug abuse issues for veterans is because it's so glaring to lose that. It's so jarring to step into sort of the alienated landscape of working class America and do that. And so that's what the uh, American Legion and the VFW did after World War II and to a lesser, to some extent after Vietnam. What's interesting now is that the, the successful veterans organizations take a different form. American Legion and Veterans for Foreign Wars on the local level still, you know, they'll have their lounges, et cetera. But on the national level, they've largely become lobbying organizations that help you get federal aid. That is not the same as an institution of civil society. That's a social service. So the newer veterans groups are saying, we are going to bring you together, sometimes literally for a new mission. There's the mission continued, I think was the name of one group. And they just look for things that need to be done. Oh, it could be from a playground being rebuilt to a levee being repaired. And they sort of do quasi-military undertakings to do it. Or they you know, all get together and run a half marathon or a triathlon. So the newer growing veterans organizations, they're not the smoky bar, which is too bad. I love hanging out at the, at the smoky bar and I will never ever do a triathlon in my life. But the newer veterans organizations are based around bring people together, have them try to do something that's difficult and do it together. Sometimes a higher purpose, like helping the community, sometimes uh, just something difficult, like a triathlon. And so that really is a, a, a very interesting case study. And somebody could do uh, multiple books just on veterans, connection, and civil society. Hi, this is Diana. Um, and as you were saying that, it occurred to me 
that really it's perhaps not a question of connection so much as meaning that these groups yes they are together and that's nice and everything but really what it's providing that is sort of lacking in modern life is a sense of deep meaning um, of purpose and a lot of people don't have that otherwise and that may be something that is more important than just the connection i i think you're it's good to make the distinction i think ultimately you the the two are inseparable because man is a, a social animal but to give you an example of, of meaning and purpose and where you're exactly right um again i talked earlier about volunteering and serving other people there was um there's a look that you've seen if you belong to something like a, a neighborhood swimming pool or you know a church where somebody starts walking towards you with a look in their eyes and you know that they're about to rope you in to volunteer for something and I remember seeing this after after mass one day at St. Andrews, our old parish. And usually my wife is like, let's go home. You know, I want to get ready for the school week and I want to hang out and talk to everybody. But here I saw the athletic director of, of St. Andrews walking towards me. I was like, Katie, let's go. And he catches me. He's like, hey, Tim, uh, I see Meg is signed up for basketball. And I say, yeah. He says, well, it's great. We got a lot of girls from the parish. We can have a St. Andrews team in the Montgomery County League. I said, okay, that's that's great. Uh, look forward to your emails on this, Michael. He said, no, we need a coach. I said, okay, I will email you some names and some guys I think would be good coaches. He said, Tim, I was hoping you could coach. I said, Michael, you know I love serving the parish. You know I would love to do it this year, not a good year. Oh, no, is, is something wrong? I said, well, I'm, I'm really busy. I'm, I'm writing a book. He says, oh, what's the book about? At which point I try to explain it's a book about the importance of local community. And by the time my sentence is over, I have become the kindergarten girls basketball coach for St. Andrews. So this is the way community gives us meaning and purpose. But importantly, Diane, I think it is about connection and belonging to others, because I do think that ultimately that is where we get um, meaning and purpose from other people modeling for us, asking us to do stuff, just having people to serve. And for me, just having uh, a wife and kids to serve sort of makes service easy. The people I need to serve are, are they live with me. Jesus said to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And I wake up and there are hungry, naked people in my house every day. They're just there. So other people, I think, are necessary for uh, the provision of meaning. But your broader point is right, that the modern world even for, especially for a wealthy society, is one in which it's easy to have all the material needs met and not have meaning. And at the same time, I'm talking about the working class and the poor, um, there's some sort of mythology sometimes in, in the higher circles that, oh, well, you know, the poor people, they don't have a lot of money or food, but they're all sticking together. If you go, if you've been to these communities and you see the drug addiction, you see the uh, lack of marriage, uh, you see the despair, you realize that it's not caused simply by a lack of money, but a lack of precisely what you're talking about, which is meaning in life. Hey, Tim, this is Tim Klingler. Are there any matrices out there that will allow us to determine if the social landscape has changed any since Joe Biden took the White House? Um, so it's tricky. I mean, in the in such a short time uh, timeline, it is hard to tell. Um, since I wrote the book, the big thing was the lockdowns and COVID, um, which had some, you know, anecdotal, you know, making next door neighbors know each other a little better, making some people value community a lot more. But you got massive alienation. You got an increase in the number of people who live alone, an increase in the number of people who don't know their neighbors, um, and a massive increase in not just crime, but what I call antisocial crime. Crime that doesn't even serve a purpose. Nowadays, when somebody commits a carjacking in Washington, D.C., it's not to sell the parts to a chop shop, but it's just to go for a joyride and then crash it. 
Um, assaults are up. Burglary and uh, was down for a long time. Uh, you do have a lot more shoplifting now, I guess. But the um, the the COVID lockdowns and telling people you had to stay away, and then closing the schools and closing the sports leagues and all that stuff. So I think the two and a half years of the the Biden administration uh, is too small to have uh, real data. Except I can say that every single year, um, for the last ten years at least, you have seen a decline in um, religious attendance across the board. It didn't accelerate or slow under Trump. It didn't accelerate or slow under Biden. Um, I actually think that um, the Trump phenomenon and the backlash to Trump may have, and I don't have it evidence for this. I haven't written this down because it's, it's a, just a hunch, but it may have actually driven uh, a decrease in church attendance because people found what they thought was a sense of meaning in politics, either resistance or um, Trumpism. On January 6, 2021, I went to the White House. I was interviewing people. I was walking with them over to the Capitol Everybody I interviewed in and around the Capitol, uh, not in, but around the Capitol, um, I asked them a question I didn't think any other reporter would ask them, which is, I said, where do you go to church? Every single person answered who was there because they were protesting an election they thought was stolen. Every single person said, oh, well, I don't go to church. I, I'm very spiritual. I read the Bible with my family or I, I do my own research. Um, and there was a, an alienation. And to some extent, I think our politics today both Trump and the backlash to Trump have driven the detachment from organized religion because they've re uh, they've replaced the sense of meaning found in religion with a, a political uh, sense of meaning. So I think that that has continued apace under Biden. I wouldn't blame it on Biden anymore, but more broadly on on Trump and the reaction to Trump. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, this is Diana again. If the election is then again between Trump and Biden, um, what do you see happening here? Um, I was very surprised. One of my friends is a fundamentalist Christian, and she, I was shocked, voted for Biden because she felt that Trump was evil. Um, that he didn't care about people, all of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised that it came from that quarter. Um, so I'm wondering if that turns out to be the election, the presidential candidates that we have, what do you see is happening in terms of the civic space? Um, again, I would like if if I were trying to solve our problem of alienation and I had the power to move little turn little dials um, on our politics, I would make people pay less attention to national politics. I know for some people, civic involvement means following politics and voting and knocking on doors. But I think that that and actually a lot of my colleagues at AEI have um, done studies that show that the um, the your, the more that you donate of your own income, to a national political candidate, the less you do other sort of civic activities. Like your little league coach is less likely to have donated than the neighbor, I mean, donated to a congressional candidate than your neighbor who you never see because he's in his house all day. Um, and so I think that one of the reasons that independents voted for Biden is because Biden said, you won't wake up in the morning thinking about what did your president say or tweet last night. Part of Biden's campaign, now I'm not going to talk about whether you delivered on this or anything, was sort of normalcy and you shouldn't have to worry about me. <laughs> um, as long as Trump is on the scene, uh, everybody will be focused on it. He's an absolutely extraordinary figure. I mean, the, the verdict yesterday, and then he has a CNN town hall tonight. Um, so I think that Trump simply being on the scene is harmful because, as I talked about earlier, the centralization, the centralization of our attention takes us away from local politics. Man is a political animal. We're supposed to not just live our own lives, but shape the world around us. I do it through coaching t-ball or, you know, uh, lobbying my local government and working with, with neighbors. And that's probably how most of you do it. If you don't have, if you don't 
see that way to sort of exercise your political muscles to, as Aristotle might put it, actualize your political potential, you instead turn to national politics. And that's where you're more likely to get angry, get frustrated, because you can't make a big difference. The stakes seem higher. Um, there's so many demagogues involved in that space. And so uh, that then raises the temperature on all of it. So, I, I mean, there's nobody running for president who's going to positively affect, I think, the problem of alienation. But I think as long as Trump is on the scene, because of the positive and negative attention he draws, he draws our attention away from where we can actually make a difference on the local human level and towards uh, national politics. And that that itself would be bad. Do not ask me who would win in or who would vote for Trump and Biden. If you're interested in my political views, go back to my 2016 article headline, No Trump Can't Win. And then you won't ask me to make predictions anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, given our time, I'd uh, one like to thank Shauna and, uh, for uh, stepping in today. I uh, apologize for the uh, technical difficulties I had on my end. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Want to uh, provide our participants one last opportunity to ask a question. In the few minutes that we have remaining. All right. Well, hearing none, Tim, I want to thank you for uh, speaking today. This was very engaging. Uh, full disclosure, I've not read your book, but I uh, intend to to, uh, to read it. Um, very uh, enlightening, and I think will be especially um, uh, enlightening as we head into the next election cycle to see how your observations play out. Folks, for those on today's um, program, I uh, warmly encourage you to look at the Washington Examiner. Uh, I think a lot of us here in Indiana think of it as a local paper, but I can tell you it's one of my favorite daily reads, even after having relocated to Indiana. For Indiana attorneys that have participated today, uh, we do have one hour of general CLE that has been approved. Um, some of you have sent me uh, your bar numbers. For those that have not, please do so, and we will be happy to get that submitted uh, by next Friday. Tim, thanks again for uh, for presenting today. Uh, it was warmly welcomed. And uh, with this, we are concluded. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs>